Hello, once again, Kenny Jacobs from Bloomington, Illinois. I'm going to do a video today talking about current events as it relates to Bible prophecy. And um, You know, I think I've heard it all now. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to give you guys some encouragement here today. We're going to go through some scriptures about the rapture of the church. Um but then and then we'll get into some news stories today. I'll try to go through this quickly. Got a lot of scripture. Got a lot to cover. I'll try not to keep you too long. But uh I got to say though, I I think I've heard it all now. I I got a comment on a video a day or two ago that told me that uh Jesus is already here. And I've been blinded by the New Testament. <laughs> wow. Uh, you don't even know how to answer things like that. Uh, at least I don't. Um, but all I can say is, people, you need to take Scripture literally. It's, treat, it's teaching literal truths. Yes, there are certain symbols used in the Bible and symbolic things, but they represent literal truths and uh you need to let scripture interpret scripture people want to make god who they want to make they want to make their own god they want to make god who they want them to be who they want god to be so that they have this god that uh would agree with their lifestyle and that they feel comfortable with that's just that's that's the fact that's what's going on and uh, people want to make the Bible say whatever they want it to make, be, want it to say. They don't want to take it literally. They want to allegorize everything and make it uh, teach some spiritual, moral truth. But it's not uh, a literal, actual event that is teaching. And I'm here to tell you that the Bible prophecies are 100% sure, and they're 100% true, and they're coming to pass every single day. And uh, no, I have not been deceived by the New Testament. And in the New Testament, Jesus Christ says that there will be a lot of false Christs and false beliefs and, and uh, not to believe that when they say that Christ is over here or he's over there. He hasn't come yet. He's going to come in the clouds and he's going to uh, call his church home into the clouds, the trumpet. And I'm going to get into that here in just a second. And then he's going to come back again in the clouds and at the Battle of Armageddon and we're going to come back with him. And those are the only two possible ways of seeing Jesus Christ. Get called up into the clouds at the rapture or coming back with him at the battle of Armageddon. There was, Jesus is not already here. Yes, his spirit is. Yes, his church is. The Holy Spirit is indwelling all the, all the believers here on the planet right now. But soon the church and, the whole, and that indwelling of the Holy Spirit will be gone. It will be removed. It will be taken out of the way so that the Antichrist can take over the one world government, the one world religion. And we see that forming right now. So let's <clears throat> let's get into some scripture. If you've watched a lot of my videos, I've gone over this before, no doubt, and you've heard all this before, but it doesn't hurt to hear it again, and it's certainly a good encouragement. And then for new subscribers or people who are just stumbling onto this video, I hope you'll watch this and, and listen with an open heart. I'm open mind, because I'm here to give you some encouragement. So let's let's talk about the rapture of the church. And and first of all, <clears throat> let's just talk, well let's just go to the, the famous rapture scripture first of all. First Thessalonians chapter four verses sixteen to eighteen. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with a trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, interestingly enough, recently I've been told that that verse where it says we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, I have been told that I'm misreading that verse, that clouds does not mean clouds. And that to meet the Lord in the air does not mean up in the air. And I'm, again, going to tell you, read the Bible literally and quit trying to make it say something it does not say. Take it literally. Yes, the church is going to be caught up in the clouds with the Lord to meet the Lord in the air to go back to the Father's house. He talks about that in John 14, 1 through 3. He's going to take us back to the Father's 
house where he has been preparing a place for us. And he's promised to come back and receive him unto himself, that where he is, there we may be also. And he, for 2,000 years, has been back in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father in, in heaven. And uh, that is pictured in Revelation 5. But let's move on. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of the final seven-year period of time is it is Daniel's 70th week. It's the final week of a prophecy he was given. And no, that has not already happened. Uh, contrary to very popular beliefs among a lot of people in the church these days, that all these prophecies have already happened. And no, they, it hasn't. Um, it's also the time of Jacob's trouble. So the purpose of this time, the final seven-year period of time, is for God to judge sinful mankind. To judge mankind has rejected Jesus Christ. And to reveal him, himself and reveal the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to the Jewish people and save Israel. That is the whole purpose of Daniel's 70th week. It has not a single thing to do with the church of Jesus Christ. The purpose of this period, time period is not to punish and beat up the church and to test the church. In fact, the church is promised the exact opposite of that. And that's why I wanted to get, get into a lot of scripture again. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, Starting at uh, verse 2, it says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Again, I have to stop and point this out. You have to read these verses carefully, and you have to pay very close attention to the pronouns that are used. Because it says, you yourselves know perfectly well in verse 2. Verse 3 says that when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Verse 4 goes back to ye, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are children of the light, and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Let's go to verse 9. It says, For God hath appointed us to wrath. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> I said that definitely wrong. Verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we and us are not the same people as they and them. And the post-trib people just don't seem to see that. They don't seem to understand that. The church is not appointed to wrath. God's plan for the seven years is not to beat up his church and test it. Again, I'll come back to that again in a minute. But let's go to Daniel uh, chapter 9 and, and start with the Daniel 70th week prophecy. Uh, he was given a prophecy that, would, that actually covers 490 years to keep this somewhat short. I'm not going to go into all of that, but I'm going to tell you that the 69th week of the 70th week ended when Jesus was cut off or crucified. Let's go to Daniel 9 verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end shall, thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay, 69th week ended when Jesus Christ was crucified. Daniel's 70th week has not started. 
and will not start until the Antichrist confirms the covenant with many for that final one week period of time. This week is seven years. And then it says here, in the, in the midst of the week, in the middle of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. The Antichrist is going to enter a temple that will be rebuilt in Jerusalem for the final seven year period of time. He will enter that temple of the abomination of desolation and desecrate the temple and declare himself to be God. At that point, then, a lot of stuff starts to happen. And we're going to get into all of that here as quickly as possible. But let's go to Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. This is Jesus talking. He says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in, the, in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, nor nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. That is what Jesus is referring to. The same prophecy of Daniel 9.27, when he when the Antichrist enters the temple, the abomination of desolation. Now, there has been a 2,000 year gap so far between the end of Daniel's 69th week and so far because the 70th week has not started. The gap there, the whole purpose of that gap was the church age. The Jewish people rejected the Messiah. The gospel was then given over to the Gentile world. And Jesus founded his church. And for the last 2,000 years, we have been in the church age, which is about to end. Now, um, let's look at Jeremiah real quick. Jeremiah chapter uh, 30, verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jacob is Israel. This is the time of Jacob's trouble, and he shall be saved out of it. Okay? Now, let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 talks about the three and a half year period of time after the abomination of desolation. Okay, so let's start at um, let's start at verse twelve, Revelation twelve twelve. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted he. He persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she, she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, a times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood, after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now, the woman here is Israel. And Satan is going to persecute and try to kill all the Jews. And it's going to happen after he enters the temple in Jerusalem and at the abomination of desolation, three and a half years into the final seven-year period of time. Remember, he confirms the covenant many for one week. Here it says that the, the Jewish people are nourished for a time, a times, and half a time from the serpent. That is three and a half years, which corresponds to Daniel 9.27 and Matthew 24.15. Now, Let's go to Second Thessalonians real quick. Second Thessalonians chapter two, uh, verse three and four. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Again, that's the abomination of desolation when Antichrist enters the temple. Three and a half years 
into the final seven years, breaks his agreement with Israel. Then the then the Jews flee and are persecuted. They've been are persecuted by Satan himself through the Antichrist. Now, um, let's go to Revelation chapter thirteen, verses five to nine. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, and to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Again, up in verse 5, it says it was, the Antichrist was given power to continue 40 and 2 months. Again, 3 and a half years. But I've been recently told that 3 and a half years does not mean 3 and a half years. Even though Daniel 9.27 re refers to it, uh, Jesus refers to it, Matthew 24.15, and Revelation refers to it in Revelation 12, Revelation 13. It is a literal time period of 3 and a half years. So you've got to do some serious rewriting of scripture and reinterpreting scripture if you're going to make that not mean three and a half years okay now verse 13 verse 9 revelation 13 verse 9 is very important it says if any man have an ear let him hear okay i'll be coming back to that verse here in just one minute but again, this is referring to the final three and a half years leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ at the Battle of Armageddon. Now, I want to go to Romans real quick. As I said earlier, that the final seven year period of time doesn't have anything to do with the church. And it doesn't. Let's go to Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob and again this is the time of Jacob's trouble when God is dealing with Israel revealing himself to them and saving them it has nothing to do with the church. As I said earlier, the, this time period has nothing to do with beating up the church and testing the church. In fact, the church has promised the exact opposite. Let's go to Revelation chapter three, verse eight. It says, and I, this is to the letter. This is in the letter to the church of Philadelphia, and Jesus says, "I know thy works." Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and thou hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Verse 10 says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Again, there's a distinction there. He's going to try, to try all the people that dwell upon the earth. But these people aren't included in the people that dwell upon the earth because they're not on the earth because they were promised to be taken out of that time period. They're not even going to be here for that time period. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. I shall come upon all the, the earth. I'm going to skip down to Isaiah 57.1 real quick. Give you a perfect picture of that. Isaiah 57. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away. None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. The church is taken away from the evil to come, which is the tribulation period. Now, a lot, lot to cover here. Um, but let's look at, at all of the seven churches. All of the letters in Revelation 2 and 3 end with the phrase, He that has, hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay, now, Revelation 3, 8 said, Behold, I set before thee an open door to the church at Philadelphia, the church that is promised to not be here during the time period. At the end of Revelation chapter 3, the letters to the churches are over, and Revelation 4, 1 starts with this. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. 
Hmm. Open door. Revelation 3. It is set, behold, set before thee an open door. Revelation 4. 1. I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven. Scripture interprets Scripture. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Hereafter, the church age. That's why church isn't mentioned anymore in the Bible. And that's why in Revelation 13, 9, it says, If any man have an ear, let him hear. Uh, and not only that, but it, let's go back there again. It says, If any man have an ear, let him hear. Two important things are missing there. It says, if any man have an ear, let him hear, period. It doesn't say, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Why is that? Because the churches are no, the church is no longer here, and the Holy Spirit has been taken out. He's no longer indwelling believers like he did during the church age. Yes, there will be people saved by the preaching of the two witnesses, the 144,000 angels proclaiming the gospel. People will be saved because God is long-suffering and patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So even people who reject, well, I don't think the people that rejected the gospel will be saved. They, they will believe the strong delusion. But there will be people that will have maybe have not heard the gospel that will be saved during that time period due to the preaching of the word. But notice the word the Spirit isn't in verse 9. It says, hear what the Spirit says, and it doesn't say about the churches. So, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians. See, the post-trib people, they, just, they, they don't rightly divide Scripture for one, and they always tell you, show me one verse that tells you. You can't find one specific verse that explains everything. The one book that explains everything is right here. And if you're willing to rightly divide the word of this book and study it, and put all of it together, you can clearly see the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. If you're looking for one one verse, you're not going to find just one verse. All right. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse uh, starting at verse 6, And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they love not the they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the love of the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But thirteen says verse thirteen says but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the very beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Again, pronouns changing. The people that didn't receive the love of the truth, they and them will believe a lie because they did not love the truth and had pleasure in unrighteousness. But you are appointed to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. God is not going to pour out His wrath and try to deceive and, and fool the people who have the sanctification of the Spirit and believe the truth. It's to pour out His wrath and the delusion on the people who rejected the truth. It has nothing to do with the church. This this part it just does not. I, mean, I can stress that over and over and over. I have zero doubt in my mind that the tribulation period does not have the church in it. It's pre-tribulation. And I know all you post-tribbers are going to quote, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the, moon is, the sun is dark and the moon won't give its light and all that stuff. Yes, that's correct. After the tribulation, there's a second coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming, not the rapture of the church. Um, is it Zechariah 14? Yes, Zechariah 14, 5. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, and for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal, yea, ye shall flee. Like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. The saints come back to earth with Jesus, at the second coming, 
Um, in Jude, verse, verse 14, And Enoch prophesied, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. The saints come back with Jesus. Now, Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. That's the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. Revelation 11, or 19.11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And verse 14 says, And the armies which were in heaven followed upon him on horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And right up in verse 8 it says, The clean the, the linen, the, fi the clean white linen is the righteousness of the saints. Um, so again, the church is not here. Let's go to uh, Titus 2.13. Titus 2.13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave, him for, gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. That peculiar people is the church. It will be called to heaven at the glorious appearing in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's where we'll be during the final seven year period of time. And based on all of the uh, the news, that day is very, very close. I, I watched a great video today by uh, Anita Fuentes. I follow her, I watch her on YouTube, but I do not agree with her take that it's a post-tribulation rapture. She did a great hour-long video today about Mark of the Beast technology, fantastic video. And then at the end, she says, uh, we all have to be prepared to be beheaded for not accepting the Mark of the Beast. Uh, we all have to be ready. No, we don't. The church has to be taken out of here before the wicked can be revealed. And I went through Second Thessalonians again, noticing the differences between they and them and us and we. They and them are the ones that uh, are facing the trials and tribulations. Yes, we all face tribulation. That just means trials and difficulties and troubles. We've had those our whole life. We always will until we're taken out of here. But that doesn't mean you're going to be here for Daniel's 70th week. Revelation 3.10, I will keep thee from the hour that will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. All right, let's get into some news stories. Uh, try to get through these pretty quick for you. University of California students chant Allahu Akbar after anti-Israel vote. Activists waving Palestinian flags reportedly heckled Jewish students at the University of California, Davis, and chanted Allahu Akbar during a student government vote last week to call on the school to boycott Israel. A student government resolution passed 8-2 to two Thursday and formally recommends the university divest from companies who do business with Israel, such as American companies and Caterpillar and uh, Raytheon and a few other companies. Uh, Hamas and Sharia law have taken over UC Davis, she boasted, alongside a photo taken at the meeting. That was... Uh, Azka Faya, as a member of the UC Davis Student Gen uh, Senate, gleefully posting on Facebook after the vote that Israel will fall. That's going on in our American campuses right now. It makes me sick. All right, uh, let's move on. Times of Israel. Come on. This is how the Times of Israel today. Outrage in Middle East over IS killing a, a Jordan pilot. Now, I want to point out the something in this article. It's very, very interesting. I've seen it in all sorts of news sources. I'm reading it now out of Yahoo News. Outrage in Middle East over ISIS killing of Jordan pilot. It says... Um, 
It says, a, a video showing Islamic State militants burning a captive Jordanian uh, pilot to death brought an outpouring of grief and rage across the Middle East on Wednesday. It's brutality horrifying a region long acute, accustomed to violence. By the way, I saw the whole video, and it's unbelievable how evil man can be and what they can do to other human beings. It is absolutely amazing. Um, it just shows you the spirit of Antichrist is alive and well. And uh, we always need to pray for each other. It's, it's crazy out there. Um, political and religious leaders offered angry denunciations and called for blood. Um, but let me scroll down here, because this is just amazing. It says, The head of Sunni Islam's most respected seat of learning, Egypt's Al-Azhar, said the militants deserve the Quranic punishment of death. Crucifixion, or the chopping off of their arms for being enemies of God and the Prophet Muhammad. And then the next paragraph says, Islam prohibits the taking of an innocent life, um, said this sheikh in, in a statement, adding that by burning the pilot to death, the militants violated Islam's prohibition on the mutilation of bodies even during wartime. Now, don't you see the contradictory statements there? Let's go back. The head of the Sunni Islam's most respected seat of learning said, the militants who killed this pilot, deserve the Quranic punishment of death, crucifixion, or the chopping off of their arms. For what? For being enemies of God and the Prophet Muhammad. But then they turn around and say that Islam is a religion of peace. Islam prohibits the taking of innocent life. But so wait a minute, you just, you just said, the Quran... <laughs> the Quran says that you have to crucify or chop off the arms of people who are, are what? Just enemies of the Prophet Muhammad. So which is it? The fact of the matter is, Islam is not a peaceful religion. Period. It's not. There are certainly apostate Muslims out there who try to live in peace who aren't in, involved in jihad, but the Hadith and the Quran teach that. Just because there are Muslims who aren't involved in that does not mean Islam itself is a peaceful religion. And, and the hypocrisy there is amazing. Saying that they deserve to be crucified or have their arms chopped off, which is what the Quran says to do to people who, um, you know, offend the Prophet Muhammad. Um, people need to wake up. It's, it's incredible. Um, let's move on. Biden and other Democrats may skip Netanyahu's speech. Imagine that. It's not a political. What kind of message is that sending to Israel and to the nation? Not to mention the fact that Benjamin Netanyahu knows what's going on. He understands what's going on with Iran. He understands what's going on with Middle East uh, radical Islam and how they want to wipe Israel off the map. So maybe our government might learn something from Benjamin Netanyahu when he comes and speaks. But no, they're going to possibly skip it. Joe Biden is among those not committed to attending the Israel Prime Minister's address to Congress. Uh, dozens of House Democrats are privately threatening to skip the March 3rd address, according to lawmakers and aides, in what's become the lowest point of a relationship between Israeli Prime Minister uh, Bar and President Barack Obama that's never been good. Um, Democrats have had, a, had to balance publicly supporting Israel with backing Obama, who's trying to close the deal with Iran to curb its nuclear programs over vehement opposition from Netanyahu, who has expressed concerns that the U.S. president is being naive. Without a doubt, the U.S. president is being extremely naive, and he's going to sign a bad deal, uh, and America is going to be in serious trouble when he, when, when he does. But uh, not even going to go listen to him speak. The disrespect that we show Benjamin Netanyahu is just incredible. Never thought I'd see it in America. Um, let's go on. So I'm trying to get through these news stories for you pretty quick. Um, I love this story. Um, let me find it. Darn it. Here we go. This is out of uh, Eretz Sheva today. Edelstein, the truth of our rights to Israel is biblical. This is a great article. Unfortunately, these articles do not get enough publicity, enough airtime. Edelstein, let's just skip over that. Um, 
Knesset Speaker Yuli Edelstein, Donald Trump, and Joan Rivers um, were just honored, were awarded honorary prizes in New York on Tuesday. Um, the, the prize was given to Edelstein by the Jewish paper which hosted the event for his struggle for the truth, explaining that he influenced positive, positively through his actions for the Jewish people in the world and in Israel. Jewish community leaders were in attendance at the event. Today, unfortunately, there is no concept of pure, ultimate truth, said Edelstein while accepting the award. The truth of the claims by others on our land does not exist. Noting the historical connection of the Jewish people to Israel, Edelstein referenced the biblical patriarch, saying, When I leave my home, I walk on paths where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob walked. And that's the truth regarding our rights to the land. When, the, when Mahmoud Abbas shouts at the UN about rights to the land, that's a complete lie, emphasized Edelstein. Switching to another topic, he added, Whoever claims that an agreement with Iran is a good path to peace is lying, because the truth is that they are approaching nuclear weapons, and the world must act now before it's too late. But of course, our government won't even listen to that message. With Zechariah 12.9, the Lord says, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Uh, that's probably what's about to happen to our nation, thanks to Barack Hussein Obama's treatment of the Israeli people. Um, speaking of the war on Islam and Barack Obama, this is out of uh, Now the End Begins. And the title of this article is, Mr. Obama, when will you get angry about radical Islam? Answer, never. Uh, it says, once again, our president is declaring that we are not at war against Islamic terrorism. America wants to know, when is President Obama going to get angry? When is he going to slam his fist on the desk, demand vengeance, put aside his um, campaigning, and call out the Islamic radicals of ISIS as the animals they are? Interpreted in the course of yet another photo op on the benefits of Obamacare, inter excuse me, interrupted in the course of yet another photo op on the benefits of Obamacare, the president looked almost irritated Tuesday to be asked his reaction to the murder of the Jordanian pilot shown on the internet being burned alive by ISIS. We have reaffirmed that the United States is not and never will be at war with Islam. Islam teaches peace. Muslims, the ruled over, aspire to live with dignity and a sense of justice. And when it comes to America and Islam, there is, no, there is no us and them. There is only us because millions of Muslims, Americans, are part of the fabric of our country. He talked openly about the bankrupt ideology of this organization like he, like he was addressing unhealthy menu choices at a fast food company. Where's his outrage? President Barack Obama says he rejects the notion that the war on terrorism is any kind of religious war against radical Islam and that the U.S. should align itself with the 99.9% .9 of Muslims who are looking for peace and prosperity. Uh, there are approximately 1.6 billion Muslims on this earth. Over 300 million are aligned with jihad, with jihad terrorism. That's not a tenth of 1%. Being raised in a Muslim country and as a Muslim, Barack Hussein Obama knows full well that, that the Quran, what the Quran says about global domination. He knows the jihad verses. He purposely placed radical Muslim Brotherhood members into key and very sensitive positions in our government. He allowed the new political party, UMAA, made up of Muslim Brotherhood members to assemble and meet in our State Department. When will the left-wing nuts get their heads out of the sand and see what this usurper is doing to destroy America? The fact of the matter is, I don't think they will. Uh, I really don't. Um, this is a follow-up to a news story I covered yesterday about the UN Youth Assembly meeting at the United Nations and how the, the youth is being indoctrinated into the New World Order. Here are five priorities that they came up with. Five priorities for the post-2015 Millennial Development Goals. Number one, leave no one behind. I suggest you make sure you know you don't get left behind because Jesus Christ is coming for his church soon. Number two, put sustainable sustainable development at the core. Again, sustainable development sounds very interesting until you read about Agenda 21 and all the other stuff out there about depopulation and, and control of the people. 
New World Order. Number three, transform economies for jobs and inclusive growth. Inclusive. Listen to Barack Hussein Obama and Pope Francis and their new war on income inequality. Four, build peace and effective, open, and accountable institutions for all. And number five, forge a new global partnership, which would also be known as a new world order. That's what our youth are being encouraged to accept, believe in, and try to take part in. One last news story out of the Eretzsheva today. Waf's new weapon, Screaming Girls. It just goes to show you how crazy it's, what it was happening over in the Middle East, what's happening in Jerusalem and on the Temple Mount. Young girls leap in front of Jewish worshippers, screaming, Allahu Akbar, the Jews are dogs. Oh, boy. Um, the Temple Institute reported on its Facebook page Tuesday that the Muslim supremacists who dominate the Temple Waf have come up with a new weapon against Jewish visits, visits to the Mount in the form of young girls. The new... Darn it. Sorry. The... My Google crashes all the time. One moment. Let's try this again. The new the newest Islamic projectile aimed at the heart of Jewish worshipers on the Temple Mount is little girls, young pre -pu -pu young pre Pubescent girls can now be found aplenty on the Temple Mount. Because they are Muslim, young, and female, the Israeli police won't touch them. The young girls, following the instruction and encouragement of their elders, feel free to leap in front of Jewish worshippers, screaming in their high-pitched voices, Allahu Akbar, the Jews are dogs, and whatever else comes to their innocent minds, while at the same time jabbing their fingers in the faces of Jewish worshippers. Sometimes the little angels get so wrapped up in their game of harass the Jews that they even begin pushing the Jewish worshippers. Religion of peace, right? Uh, what is a self-respecting, dignified human being to do in response? Ask the Institute. Push the little girls back. Uh, pull on their ponytails. A group of six Jewish worshippers Sunday did what they thought was responsible and appropriate thing to do. They called on the police to intervene. The police did, arresting the Jews and holding them in custody for more than 24 hours. All this goes to prove the wildly successful effectiveness of the Muslims' latest weapon in their ever-improving arsenal in the war against the Jews on the Temple Mount. Um, <laughs> again, where's Pope Francis in this? When's he going to step in? When's he going to demand that the, the, for tolerance be included, that the Jews be included in that? And that the Jews get, are given their rights to pray on the Temple Mount and ultimately build their temple. This whole religion of tolerance and inclusion doesn't seem to include two things. The Jews and Christianity. True, biblically based Christianity that's not part of the New World Order system of uh, this new ecumenical movement. If you believe in the truth of the word of God and you believe Jesus Christ is the only way, or if you're a Jew, you are not accepted by the new world order elite. That's just a fact. And that's just another sign that Jesus Christ is coming soon. We're living in the last days. So, if you do not know today for sure that you are saved, today is a day of salvation. You truly are running out of time. God has given you so many reasons to, to know that he existed, that he is real. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He said himself, no man comes to the Father but by him. God has given us prophetic sign after prophetic sign to prove that the word of his, that his word is true and that the events are happening exactly like the Bible said they would. And Jesus will still save you if you call upon him in faith. The Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you must confess that he is the Son of God and ask him to save you right now, and he will. But again, he is the only source of salvation. There's no other path to God, regardless of what the world wants to tell you. Jesus Christ himself is the only way. He will save you, but you're running out of time. 
Time is short. Keep looking up. God bless everyone.